Thanks, Dave, uh, for inviting me to speak here, and uh, thank you all. Um, so Dave uh, asked me to emphasize in this presentation um, the how and the what um, is different. So many of you receive um, these uh, regional to national lightning network data that principally give you the cloud to ground lightning. And so I want to show you what you're missing uh, and what we're going to get with the uh, space-based observations of lightning and uh, how, the, how we got there. Let's see. All right, so the fact that lightning could be seen from high altitudes was noted a long time ago, anecdotally from uh, the early uh, U-2 pilots and more focused observations from Apollo and the early space shuttle flights. The astronauts reported seeing some lightning flashes that they say extended 800 kilometers horizontally, basically extending the length of, uh, say, a squall line or tra into the trailing stratiform region. In fact, they coined the term sympathetic lightning. They would see lightning at the top of the clouds and it would propagate uh, along the line. And so uh, it, it's been observed there for a long time and now we've reached the point where we think there's some useful applications by detecting the total lightning. And what I mean by total lightning is the lightning in the cloud and the lightning that strikes the ground. And I'll talk about some of the differences between what we'll see with our instrument versus what you can see today from just ground-based systems. So I want to show you uh, this movie, which hopefully we'll play. This is from the International Space Station. Um, videos taken by the crew to show you uh, what the lightning looks like uh, from space. So here you see these pools of light. So here it's nighttime and you can see the lightning uh, pretty well. This is identifying where the convective cells are. And then here's another uh, uh, animation, which is uh, in the late, um, afternoon and you can actually see some cloud. I don't think I have to click. Let's see. Okay, there should be another part to this. So there you are at night. Okay, it may be I didn't, you don't have the, the version I thought you had. So we'll go on from here. Um, here's a picture of the current uh, JLM science team and our partners. Uh, I want to mention also, in addition to the space station, I was present for SDS-6, which was a space uh, shuttle mission in April of 1983, where we had a handheld camera held by the astronaut that was doing mapping of lightning. So it wasn't quantitative, it was just uh, video, but uh, that's sort of when the story begins. Um, I began with the program back in 1979, so I think that's what, 37 years ago. We had the first uh, concept studies, there was a meeting held in Tullahoma, Tullahoma, Tennessee, and the question at that time was, can you see lightning from space? And if you can, um, what's the best way to detect it? Do you use radio frequency detectors, uh, high frequency radio receivers or can you do it optically? And it turned out because of the uncertainties of the properties of the ionosphere, we didn't know how the radio signals would get through the ionosphere and that you could actually locate at storm scale spatial resolution using radio frequencies. So we went with the optical and you'll see some results from that. So here's some weather impacts that are related with lightning and some may surprise you, but uh, hurricanes uh, at times do have strong vertical motions and do produce lightning. Uh, tornadic storms and severe storms make lightning. Uh, flash floods, when we have storms that are training with each other and collecting or sitting in one place, you often see a lot of lightning associated with them. Even blizzards and snowstorms, when we have high liquid water contents, we'll see uh, lightning, lake effect snow. In fact, you mentioned the Weather Channel and uh, Jim Cantore, I remember him being on the air and getting all excited about uh, thunder snow. Now, thunder snow really isn't all that rare. I guess it just wasn't around as much. Um, and we see lightning for the sake of seeing lightning, so lightning can be a danger to people on the ground, and uh, emergency managers are interested in what the threat is of lightning. And typically, the first in-cloud lightning occurs before the first cloud-to-ground lightning, giving you some lead time that the threat is there. That's also very useful at airports where you're doing fueling and and you got uh, baggage handlers on the, carmac, on the tarmac, so I think that will be useful. Um, forest fires ignited by lightning. We don't know for sure. This would be a bit speculative, but 
Um, what starts fires from lightning is not the polarity of the lightning, but it's the duration of the contact with the fuel uh, that's on the ground. And so when we see lightning at one pixel uh, illuminated for a long period of time, the likelihood is there's a phenomenon we call continuing current. Current's continually flowing into that fuel, and that duration is what's igniting the, 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 the fuel source and, and creating the fire. So we don't know that that will pan out, but it could be that there'll be a useful application. Some people are saying, yeah, the baseline products that we're starting you with, only 26 products, that's like scratching the tip of the iceberg. It's 10% it's, uh, maybe of what we can do with Gozar, and we'll learn all this as time goes on, and even volcanic eruptions uh, will make lightning at times. And then in the lower right here, I have an image here showing you our low Earth orbiting lightning sensor we had on a NASA research mission showing you where the lighting is. Principally, it's over land. There's some hot spots uh, in uh, North and South America. Uh, and then in the Gulf Stream, you see the lightning. And um, it's kind of small here, so I think it's, let's see here, if I can point on the screen. Uh, there we go. So here's the Gulf Stream lightning occurring here. Uh, Florida is a hot spot in, uh, in the United States, you got the Sierra Madre Mountains, you got the Cuban, uh, Cuba and the related islands here, Mediterranean. The hot spot on the planet, actually, at the frequency, highest frequency of uh, lightning is uh, over 300 days per year here over Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. And then the most intense uh, squall lines and uh, mesoscale convective systems occur in the La Plata Basin here in Argentina where we'll get 1,000 flashes per minute that will go on for hours and hours and hours. Um, so what kind of warning products can we make uh, related to using the lightning? Here's some examples. Um, severe storm warning lead time, we think because the lightning, the total lightning has given us an indication of the intensity of the storm updraft and how it is intensifying with time. Um, will be useful to not only make warnings more accurate, false alarms uh, less uh, when you're only using the Doppler radar and and we find from our research that we can also increase the lead time based on a phenomenon we call lightning jump, which is basically a rapid change in the total flash rate. Hurricane intensity, there's been some work going on showing the, the absence or presence of lightning in the rain bands and eye wall can be an indicator of whether there's strong shear. We know that strong shear is an enemy of hurricane intensification. It rips it apart. So if we see a lot of lightning, it's indicating there's probably strong vertical shear. Um, lightning detection by itself, as I said, you know, in-cloud lightning before the first cloud to ground, rainfall rate, if we have high rainfall rates and they're sustained, generally there's continual lightning activity, igniting fires, I mentioned air transport, initial convection developing. <clears throat> so here's, here's an example. There's many ways to detect lightning and then here I'm trying to elucidate some of these differences. So for example, here at Kennedy Space Center, they have a field mill network. It just measures the electric field aloft and it can tell you if you've got electrified clouds, you'll get a foul weather versus a fair weather uh, indication um, with a few kilovolts per meter of uh, electric field aloft. And that actually is one of the launch commit criteria, but you know for tomorrow, it's not going to be an issue. They're only concerned about uh, cumulus clouds. We also have high-speed digital video cameras, all sky cameras that see the lightning uh, visually. We have very high frequency lightning networks. They're short range, but can detect the in-cloud uh, lightning channels. We have a national network of cloud-to-ground lightning detection, which operates at low frequency where the lightning propagates a long distance. We even have uh, long-range international spherics networks, which are looking at very, very low frequency and they can see the lightning signal, the radiation signal will hop off the ionosphere and it will, it will have one or two bounces and propagate long distances. And with a network of receivers, you can get a, an idea of where the lightning originated from. We have planes, balloons, and so forth. And then we have the optical imagers in space. So we've flown the low Earth orbiting lightning imager on the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission. We have a launch planned for January 22nd for one of our flight spares for a lightning sensor on the International Space Station. And then, of course, there's the geolightning mapper uh, for GOES-R. And one of the things we'll use the International Space Station lightning imager for, which is a copy of the earlier research version that we flew, is it'll underfly GOES-R and uh, provide uh, an independent source of validation. 
and that'll help us with the on-orbit uh, performance assessment for GLM. And I mentioned here some key, uh, key takeaway messages in the bottom. So key performance measures we're looking for is the detection efficiency, what fraction of all the lightning uh, do we see versus what do we not see, location accuracy, uh, the flash type. So the geostationary lightning mapper cannot tell us uniquely on a flash by flash basis, that's a cloud flash, that's a ground strike, that's a cloud flash, that's a cloud flash, that's a ground strike. Um, the ground-based networks are very good at telling us it's a cloud to ground flash, but they, don't, they do less well on an in-cloud flash. So one of the things the weather service is looking at, how might you combine these two types of data together for the best science product. And you also want your data stable and consistent so that throughout the course of a day or a month that the uh, performance of your system is stable. And in some cases, these, these long-range lightning networks are subject to the vagaries of the day-night ionosphere changes and noise in the local environment. And so keeping them stable um, throughout time is, is more of a challenge than if you just do it optically. When we're looking optically down at the top of the cloud detecting lightning for the given instant that we're looking, it's stable for the whole field of view. So how do we use the data? It'll be available for input into weather forecasting models. There are scientists now looking at how much you assimilate the lightning data in lieu of the absence of other data types, especially over the oceanic regions into the models for now casting and warning to, uh, decision support systems. Here's a lightning flash at, uh, from a digital video camera at 7,500 frames per second, and you can see this is what a lightning flash looks like as it's tapping space charge, working its way uh, down to the ground. And all these little uh, non-ending little uh, sparks you're seeing, these small channel pieces, they're a space charge that they're tapping into, but they're not making connection to the ground. We aren't going to see that from space. That, that, those, that light is too weak to get through the cloud. But when it does make connection with the ground, in this case it's a cloud to ground flash, the channel goes up into the cloud, and the light that's up in the cloud will make its way to cloud top. And here it comes. Boom. So that cloud to ground flash, when that return stroke, as we call it, is bringing current up to the cloud, the channel's up inside the cloud. I'll show you another example. Steve, are those those flashes that we're seeing before it connects, are those stepped leaders? Is that what yeah, those called? are those are steps, right. I wanted to make sure. Yep, and they're not making connection. It's still going on. So. That's, that's a flash that's lasting, uh, you know, a few, few seconds worth of a lightning flash. So there's a lot there <laughs> to see. So here's the GLM. Um, it's a single telescope. Um, one of our earlier concepts was looking at two telescopes so we could do a yaw flip maneuver with the satellite and still see North America and the South America land masses. We ended up with the one single telescope and then Here's a photo we took from an ER-2 high-altitude airplane. You can see this puddle of light that you get at the top of the cloud. And if it's bright enough, we'll see it from space. Here's another example of, of what the lightning looks like versus what you see. So here you're going to see uh, what we have call a regional um, very high-frequency network of receivers that can map these radio sources from the lightning. And uh, if this will play, Notice this is 50 kilometers in horizontal distance. And so here comes the flash. It began here with the X, and the channels are propagating through the cloud here over 50 kilometers up here. And then you'll see a cloud to ground strike here, and here's another one. And one of the things you'll notice is that, and there was a, re we call that a recoil streamer right there uh, that went back through the cloud. But if you look at where it struck the ground, here's one of the ground strike points here, and there's another one down here. The ground-based lightning networks will call that two separate cloud-to-ground flashes, when in reality we now know it's one lightning flash, but it had two strike points to ground during its, during its evolution. And that's been one of the realizations from these ground-based systems that give us very high resolution uh, mapping of the lightning channels, 50 meter <coughs> accuracy. So the key takeaway here is that lightning propagates over these long distances and we'll get many pixels uh, across this whole region, albeit at lower spatial resolution. Our spatial resolution for GLM pixels is eight kilometers um, across the United States, uh, pretty much, and then it gets down to about 14 kilometers out at the edge. And our coverage, I didn't mention in that opening map, uh, extends from the west coast of Africa to the east coast of New Zealand, up to Edmonton, uh, Alberta, Canada, and then down to the southern coast of uh, 
Chile. So between the two satellites goes R and S. That will be our, our uh, region of coverage. So, well, it's fun to look at these a second time. So, again, here's where it began, and it went to ground way over here. And so it's not enough to know, you know, the lightning struck the ground here. The source for that, the storm that's making the lightning, is way down over here. So you, so you thought that was an extreme event. Here's, here's an amazing flash. It's 300 kilometers in horizontal extent, mapped by one of these uh, regional networks in Oklahoma. Um, you may have heard of sprites and jets coming out of the stratiform region of mesoscale convective systems. So here's a very interesting lightning flash. You can see the whole extent of it. And the blue and the green and the red are indicating different types of uh, lightning. So here you're seeing the, the blue would be uh, negative cloud to ground, I believe. The green is positive cloud to ground. And then um, the other color would be the in-cloud lightning flash. And here you can see it propagating. Um, it began here in the white diamond and then propagates. Let's see, get my cursor back. Where are you? Yeah, it's hard to see it on the, oh, there we are. So this is where the flash begins. Here's a leading convective line of the radar. And so here's the lightning beginning here in the convective line on one of the storms and propagates in the stratiform rain region and keeps on going. We've known this since the 1950s with L-band radars. Uh, LIGDA, for example, had done radar mapping of lightning echoes. And so we know that this phenomenon happens. And then these stars are these sprites, which are these uh, upward going changes in the electric field and they cause these streamers that go up to the magnetosphere. Uh, so they're quite interesting. So uh, anyway, this flash lasted 5.7 seconds, 300 kilometers in horizontal extent. Um, the gray dots are the lightning mapping array, these VHF systems. Um, the uh, in-cloud lightning is shown as green dots. The negative cloud to ground lightning is shown as blue dots and positive cloud to ground lightning as red dots. And all this is happening in the same lightning discharge. So the ground-based systems, if their criteria were if you have one strike to ground 10 kilometers from a previous one, those are unique, separate cloud to ground flashes. And now we know this is one lightning flash that made uh, 13 strikes to ground. So it really changes your perspective. And what does it look like to us from space versus what does it look like from ground? If I can get the cursor back here to point, there we go. So here's the Washington Monument right here. And here's the lightning uh, channel going up into the cloud, up to about 12 kilometers in height. And uh, here at A is where the lightning was originating from in this convective line. This is radar. C is where the photographer took the photograph, and B is where it struck the ground. It started in Fairfax, Virginia, and and struck the ground in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, for those who know the DC area. And so you might think of this, well, that's a bolt from the blue, but uh, this is not all that unusual. So you, you see the radar echo, but what you don't see is there's cloud there. It's not going through the clear. So it's going through the cloud, and often they'll go off the anvil, and then they'll strike the ground. And the Sterling uh, Weather Service Forecast Office, their uh, science operations officer really likes to have this this picture where you see, you know, here's the, where the flash begins, goes out the anvil, strikes the ground some tens of kilometers away because it's a real hazard to folks. Dave? Steve, I was just going to mention to everybody in the, in the audience for your weathercast. I mean, this is a perfect example of explaining uh, how lightning can be dangerous away from the thunderstorm. A lot of people just wait to see it, right, if they're getting ready for their sports games or they see it on the horizon or whatever. But this kind of information is really critical in proving to them that lightning can strike many, many, many miles away, even out of the blue, like, like Steve was just saying. So just think about maybe as you develop a story, you know, severe weather, uh, and, and explaining how lightning can strike many uh, miles away from a thunderstorm, because uh, a lot of kids are out there playing ball these days, and, and parents don't want to clear the field because they want their kid to get discovered at that moment so they can be on the Olympic team or get a scholarship or something. So. And Steve, I would love to have a copy of that to put on TV, that, that graphic right there, and explain that. 
and put it on Facebook and social media because what Dave said is absolutely right. When people see something like that, it's a game changer to how they think about lightning. <clears throat> Thanks. And I, I have actually another example I'm going to show you for Lake Ontario. Is anybody from New York? Okay, so you might find that especially, uh, especially interesting. Um, so um, this is higher resolution than what GLM will have. This is uh, five kilometer pixels instead of eight, but normally it's the same thing. And I want you to see, so the VHF mapping of that lightning channel, what do the pixels look like from space looking down on the same cloud? So you get some idea of what it looks like. So here it's a plot of uh, east-west versus north-south. So the, the y-axis here is a latitude, longitude, and you see the lightning channel being painted above is altitude versus east-west distance, and those flashing boxes are the pixels illuminating. You'll note that we see more um, uh, lightning pixels when the, when the channel is in the higher part of the cloud, when it's in the lower part, we don't see it as well. And we don't know if that's attenuation or if it's because of the threshold setting that we set our instrument in. And we're gonna be, the reason you gotta wait six months for the data is we have to play with the thresholds so we can drop it to the lowest threshold that we can to pick up more of the lightning, uh, more of the lightning, even weak lightning flashes, but not to introduce false alarms. And you noticed how the, it's, it's bright in the room here, so you can't see so well, but if I can get the, the cursor here. So I'm gonna draw for you, whoops. Am I there? Oh, okay, so the pixels are outlining basically this whole thing here. So as Dave was saying, if you wanna know what's the horizontal risk, what's the risk area, we're not just telling you it's struck here, we're telling you here's the domain of threat so that's good that you knew, you now know that, but what's bad for you and the person working on the tarmac at the airport is you wanna get airplanes off the ground and you've been doing that not knowing that you've had this risk over your head, right? You didn't know it was there. Well, it's there, it's always been there, so you've been lucky. So we need, what we need to do is optimize this new information with the actual utility of the data because you can't shut down airports more than you need to, but the risk is finite. So that'll be something we'll need to work on. And I wanted to say a few words. So the lightning mapper is a different kind of animal and I wanted to just say a few words about how it works. If I can get the cursor back here. All right, next slide. So um, what I wanted to point out to you is, so if you look on the left there, there's four types of filtering we're doing to retrieve the lightning during daytime. You look out there right now, if there was a CB, you wouldn't have any clue with your eyes that there's lightning out there because you can't see it. The sunlit background is brighter than the lightning. At nighttime, yeah, you see it just great. So the, so the design challenge for this instrument is how do you detect lightning during the day optically? And so here's, here's what we do. So lightning from space appears like a pool of light. I mentioned that during daytime, the sunlight reflecting from cloud top totally swamps out and mask the lightning signal. Daytime lightning detection, was, which is what is what drove the design of this instrument. What's the solution? Spa special techniques using spectral, temporal, and spatial uh, filtering in order to pull the lightning out of the background. So spatially, so I told you there was a pool of light at cloud top. So the way we do that is we have our pixel size approximate that pool of light so that we get as much lightning signal in that pixel and that, and don't have a lot of that pixel just getting background sunlight during the daytime because that affects our signal to noise that we're able to pick up. The middle panel showing you spectral. So we know the sun is brightest at 6,000 angstroms and so if you can build an instrument with enough response at, as you're coming down off the peak of the sunlit background, you can detect the lightning. Well, it turns out lightning has two very strong emission lines. One's at 777 nanometers in the near infrared, the other's at 868. One is an oxygen uh, emission line, the other's nitrogen, and we already know oxygen and nitrogen are most of what's in the atmosphere. Well, it turns out to build a very narrow interference filter to remove all that sunlit background we don't want and pick up the lightning signal, it was easier to build that, that piece of the instrument in the telescope at the 777 nanometer band instead of the 868. So that's how we ended up at 777, and then we sample very quickly, 500 pictures a second. Every two milliseconds, we take a picture 
one megapixel, a million pixels, about 1360 by 1320 is our pixel array, each one on the order of about eight kilometers to 10 kilometers in size, and we're differencing those. Every two milliseconds, we look at the average background, and then we see a blip of light as shown in the bottom panel, and if the blip is brighter than the background, we say, aha, that must have been either noise or a lightning, and if we have more than a few of those, uh, we say, aha, that's coherent in time and space, so it's lightning, it's not a random uh, noise coming into the instrument. And so that's the pieces we put together to pull out lightning during the daytime. So you say, yeah, it's just a camera. Well, it's more than just a camera. So it is quite an achievement to be able to do that daytime lightning detection. All right, this, this is from our uh, colleagues in Canada, and I'm going to show you a bolt from the blue over Lake Ontario. And you see here, uh, lightning coming out the side of the cloud and going to ground, another example of what we were saying earlier. So here's an example with the VHF uh, lightning mapping system they have in Toronto that Environment Canada has, and these data are actually being provided to the Buffalo, New York uh, forecast office. And so you see the storm itself is out over the lake, and the lightning's propagating 14 kilometers and hitting ground near the Toronto airport. And so you can see here aloft, this is the lightning aloft, and then you see the channel coming to ground, and here it goes to ground right here in this panel. So this is height versus, um, height versus time, and then here you can see um, height versus east-west distance, and this is height versus north-south distance. It's a projection of the 3D structure of that lightning channel into these planes, and you can see where the flash went to ground in all these different panels. So here's another, uh, did I show you this already? I, that's doubled up, sorry, I skipped that. All right, so here's uh, lightning from, our, uh, from what GLM would look like looking over a tornadic storm in Oklahoma. You see the red is the high density of lightning. And one of the things lightning can do from space is when you've got obscured cirrus clouds, even though the uh, imager is seeing cloud structure, you could have embedded convection beneath that cirrus cloud shield <laughs> and you won't see that until it pops up. Well, if it's producing lightning, we'll see through the cloud like an x-ray, and so we know there's lightning there. And then this is only one minute of data showing you all the different convective cores and where the lightning is occurring, and we can accumulate that over one minute or two minutes and make density grids. So it's this kind of density grid that the Weather Service sees as being more of an operational a product. This storm right here was the uh, EF3 tornado at Stroud, Oklahoma, uh, for some of you who have been around a while, May 3rd, 1999 was an EF5 tornado in Moore, Oklahoma. They've had three EF5 tornadoes over this time from then to the present. And there's actually another storm here that makes a tornado an hour later in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But you'll notice that there's high density of total lightning uh, and some places there's less. And it gives us an idea of how mature or how intense the storm is. So let me compare this to radar. So what can it tell us? So here's these two storms. Here's a hook echo. You're all familiar with looking at radar. Here's another hook echo on that back storm that hits Tulsa later. And then here's the Doppler velocity couplet. So you can see red and green. That's telling you there's Doppler shear in the storm. And then let's look next at um, what the ABI versus the uh, lightning would look like. So on the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission satellite, we had a five-channel imager, and this is what the infrared, the thermal infrared band looks like. So you've got some cold cloud tops uh, embedded in here, but again, these storms are at different times in their life cycle, and you can see that the lightning density and the lightning rate is giving you unique information, not just uh, that you get from the infrared imager. And it tells you about the uh, growth and decay of the storm. And I also want to point out that 95% of all the lightning going on here is in cloud. Very little of that lightning is going to ground because when a storm is very intense and it's stretching uh, very high in altitude, most of the lightning discharging is between the, a negative charge region in the middle of the cloud and an upper positive charge region in the upper part of the cloud. And so you're not getting much cloud to ground lightning. So that's comparing, say, the uh, infrared, thermal infrared of ABI with GLM, and then lastly, here's what cloud to ground looks like compared to GLM. So as I said, most of the lightning is in cloud lightning, and you don't see that. You just see an occasional cloud to ground strike. So this is what you would see today, and on the left is what you'll see tomorrow. And why is that useful? So we have an average warning lead time 
for tornadoes of about 14 minutes nationally and about 20, 21 minutes in severe storms. And we think that we can improve that. And the, the reason we can do that is this uh, uh, time series you see here on the left where the uh, red line shows you the in-cloud and cloud-to-ground lightning. If I can get the cursor back up, oh, there we go. And then this is the cloud-to-ground lightning in sort of the blue color here. And you see it's flat. There's not much uh, temporal change in the cloud-to-ground lightning, whereas here in the total lightning dominated by the in-cloud lightning, we get this rapid jump or increase. And where this is very useful is here from North Alabama, this is a radar velocity couplet, and it's not clear that there's strong shear in that storm, whereas with the lightning, you see the big change in 10 minutes from modest lightning to a much greater amount of lightning, and that's the kind of signature that we can see. And where I think it's useful is um, east of the Mississippi River. How many of you are east of the Mississippi? Uh, half of you. Um, so we have, when we have tornadoes, tornadic storms there, a lot of them are nocturnal. They're late at night, so there can be rain wrapped, and you've got complex terrain blocking either the radar signal or the view of the storm spotter. So you don't have as much advantage from storm spotters to verify what's there, but these lightning signatures are there day and night. And so even if it's nighttime, the lightning mapper will help us with that. Let's see. Here's an example of how you might combine the lightning mapper with uh, the uh, rapid scan imagery that Tim was showing you. So here we can show the lightning flash rate as this brighter white uh, view. This is a derecho that went through Maryland, and the red lines there represent two tornado tracks. And so you see when the tornado gets going, we have a brightening uh, in the white there, which is indicating that the lightning rates um, have increased from what they were before. I'm not saying that's how you'll show it on the air or that's what you'll be provided by your weather provider, but it's one way that we're exploring how might you combine these different data sets. And here's another product um, developed by one of our scientists called Prob Severe Algorithm. We've been demonstrating it in our hazardous weather test bed. And what it does is it takes uh, the radar estimated maximum size of hail and then the cloud top growth rate and the cloud top emissivity. So how cold is that cloud top? And then now we've been experimenting last year bringing in these lightning jumps I've been showing you. And uh, what here's an example of what they've been finding. So for example, uh, at our hazardous weather test bed, the probability of severe for this tornadic storm was 21%, which was underestimating the likelihood of it might going, of it might going severe versus 68% when you included the signature from the lightning. So now we combine radar, satellite, lightning all together, and we combine the miracle weather prediction instability fields, and we have the best of all worlds in terms of the best information to help you diagnose and characterize that particular storm. Here's Hurricane Katrina. You might all remember Hurricane Katrina. Well, this is kind of interesting. This is a ground-based experimental network that Los Alamos Labs had to look at long-range lightning. What you see is lightning in the rain bands, and in particular, you've also got lightning here in the center in the eye wall uh, of the storm. And we only get snapshots of that now, but when GLM is up there, we'll be able to animate um, this kind of pictorial uh, view of the storm. And as I mentioned earlier, what we think is the key thing to look for is if we're seeing a lot of lightning in that eye wall, that means there's probably strong vertical shear, and that's not good for uh, continuing the storm. You might remember Katrina changed from a Category 5 to a Category 3 by the time um, it hit land. Um, this is maybe too hard to see from the back of the room, but there's been a study using the, the infrared imagery, microwave imagery, radar data from our low earth orbiting satellites and asking where the most intense thunderstorms on Earth and what's of most interest perhaps for us is the Americas and here's that area I told you about uh, if you look to uh, the La Plata Basin in Argentina where there's lots of strong systems and then also um, the mesoscale convective systems in the southern United States and the Great Plains. Also lightning, someone asked us earlier today about climate. I forgot to mention El Nino, but um, we're now going into a similar as, uh, El Nino-La Nina event like we did in 97, 98. And what happened then is um, this is our space-based lightning data. We had a maximum of lightning activity over the Gulf of Mexico. We had uh, over 200 um, hours of lightning activity greater than our normal. 
and an increase in uh, thunder days. And if you look at the panel, if I can get the cursor again here, the bottom left, 97, I think I have a, an animation, yeah, right here, 97, 90, 98. Look at the change in the Gulf of Mexico. That was the greatest increase on the planet during that El Nino event. So I'm gonna make a prediction for February of, of 2017, uh, as we did in 1998, that we might look at a strong southerly branch in the jet stream and after we open up the telescope on the imager and the lightning mapper, we're gonna have tornado outbreaks in central Florida because that's what happens when the jet stream is coming through the Gulf of Mexico and uh, we'll be there to observe it. So I'll be glad we're online um, by that time of the year. So that's the last slide I had. So I guess the takeaway messages I have for you here is the GLM will see lightning in a different way than maybe you've been seeing or portraying it uh, currently. And it will tell us about the horizontal extent of the lightning. It can help tell us where the lightning began, which storm initiated the lightning and where it travels out to. And then combined with the ground-based lightning data, we can get a more full picture on the attributes of the lightning Combine it with the imager, combine it with the radar, and uh, I think you'll have a lot of interesting data to show. All right, thank you. Steve, this is great. Thanks very much. I hope it's given, Steve's presentation has given you a lot of thought uh, to put into maybe some increased lightning stories and some things you might want to do because there's new data that's coming down. And uh, I think we know that lightning is one of the biggest killers uh, around the country. We're in the lightning capital of the world here in the state of Florida. And so I'd like to open up the floor for questions uh, that anybody has. Please, just as a, a little reminder, identify yourself and your station. Uh, press the little green button on the microphone. And um, I'll open up the floor. Mike. <coughs> Steve, Mike Mogul, Naples, Florida, how the weather works. Um, you mentioned two bands, um, omission bands, and you said 7.77. Is that the nitrogen or the oxygen? 777.4 uh, nanometers is oxygen, single ionized oxygen emission line, and the 8683 is the uh, uh, single ionized nitrogen emission line. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Jen? Jen Carfagno from the Weather Channel. Um, my question is about the increased lightning. Will it be something perceptible to the eye that we could, say, talk about on TV? For example, when we um, show Doppler radar, we can show the hook. We can show in the velocity signature where there might be a vortex, a tornado vortex signature. Will the increased lightning be something that we could observe, or is it an algorithm that has to run to detect it? You're saying observe with your eyes? Yes. Um, when you, you've probably all flown on an airplane and you've seen a big CB out to the side of the window and you see things just continually flashing, but it tends to be in the upper part of the cloud. So hopefully you're not obscured by rain and other things. So if I think it's at a distance, you can see it, you'll see the lightning uh, going on pretty much continuously. And then there's another kind of lightning which we won't see because it, we call those crawlers. They crawl on the bottom of the cloud and usually that happens at the end of the storm. Um, and, and actually, to add to that, they're more from just the, the imagery. So the, the image that you shared there with the example from D.C., it looks a little bit brighter, but I think it would be hard to pick out in real time knowing that that's the portion of the storm that lightning activity is growing without an algorithm giving you numbers that say so. You, you'll get the date. Though, so I, I didn't say much about the latency. So the, uh, the vendor, Lockheed, who built the instrument, they're allocated 10 seconds to process the data, geolocate it. Our algorithm that turns it into lightning flashes takes at most four seconds. So if you have the, the goes rebroadcast, you could actually get the data within 14 seconds or less. And actually we have streaming files that go out. So as soon as we have a lightning flash, we close the file, it goes out the satellite and back down uh, to the ground. So you could get it actually quicker than that. The weather service, because of limitations in AWIPS, they're talking about packetizing um, the data. So they would collect it in like minute blocks. And, uh, and then use it minute by minute by minute by minute. Hi, Cheryl Nelson, WTKR in Norfolk, Virginia. I know you said that this is going to be very helpful to pilots and in aviation as well. Will pilots or the FAA, are they going to be trained on this new 
imagery with lightning detection? Do we know anything about that? So that's external to the Weather Service. I don't know what the plans are, though. We have briefed the FAA, and they're very excited about the instruments. So I don't know how they do their, their training program or how the airlines uh, train their people, but presumably they're going to have to get trained up on this. Um, the Weather Service will be able to go into the Commerce Learning Center and take all the training modules that are being developed. And then if, if you're familiar with the Comet MedEd program where LAN where LAN is from, the same training modules will be available online there so people um, can certainly take them. Steve, uh, I'm a, a, a user of the uh, Prob Severe, which, by the way, for other Mets in here might not know, it is available online. You can look at it. I'm just wondering how quickly the GLM data will be incorporated into that algorithm. You see, my, that might be a really quick way to get that data out to end users as far as uh, some of the first. Oh, it's, it, it, it's in there now in an experimental mode. Right. So once the GLM starts operating, it'll, they'll start running it in there? Well, okay. So you're seeing a uh, pre-operational experimental version of the algorithm. Right. So where does that stand in reality within NESDIS or NOAA? So the plan that's being worked um, and maybe uh, Dan back there, one of the upcoming Weather Service speakers will speak to that. So they're looking at how could they operationalize that in NCEP central operations because it uses NWP input as some of the parameters in there. So I think it's been decided in general by the community, yeah, that's probably the right place to do it, but now you've got to go through all the Weather Service processes to get something like that implemented operationally. And I think right now, there's a uh, freeze, right, until like 2019 before new products can be made operational. Dan's itching to answer that question. <laughs> That's pretty accurate. One other thing that has to happen with that, and, and the timing might be such that it works out fairly well, is that there will have to be recalibration with the, the higher resolution imagery and then with the GLM. But when we do that, and then by the time it gets onboarded, it might be in that time frame. Yeah, I should mention, Dan, we're, we're funding the, the principal investigator to now recalibrate once he gets GLM ABI data, which are different. So you got higher spatial resolution. Now you got the total lightning with this consistent uh, information. Uh, the next red isn't changing yet, so you, that's still the same. And then the, they also are using the wrap, I think. So they need to transition to the high resolution rapid refresh, the three kilometer version of the model. So there are going to be a lot of retunings as Dan is saying back there. even in the even in experimental mode I found that that prob severe is very helpful to, to broadcast mass when we're monitoring a storm so the soon I'll just speak for myself and I bet I speak for the others that use it the sooner you could get that up and going even if it's got experimental stamped on it would be something for us to evaluate and we'd be glad to help you do it I think it's got a very simple crisp presentation which I would guess works best on the air for your your viewers too. Yeah, even if we don't use it on air, I can look at a storm and say, okay, I need to really watch this storm here. Yeah. So that's helpful. And that's the other thing that GLM does, Dan. I'm glad you mentioned that. So suppose I got a sea of storms, um, like in uh, some of these loops that Tim showed you. Okay, I got 100 storms out there. Which one are you going to focus your attention on? Well, having the lightning jumps gives you added impetus to focus your situational awareness on a few, few storms that are rapidly developing. Um, as opposed to trying to focus on everything that's going on. Steve, we have a question back here. Dave? Yep. Steve, can you talk a little bit about the OPC development where they're going to take the, the lightning data over the oceans along with the imagery and kind of help uh, aviation once you get out of the range of uh, weather radars? So what, what you're describing is an FAA-sponsored uh, product. It's, called, it's not the Ocean Prediction Center. It's the Offshore Precipitation capability. And I told the developer at MIT Lincoln Lab, I said, that acronym's taken. You got to <laughs> change the name. And so what it is, is they, they use an expert system. It's called Random Forest. And they try to combine different information as an interest image. And so they combine the atmosphere stability from uh, just like Prob Severe does, takes radar data, and then it takes the lightning data and the imagery data. And what it does is it tries to do this correlation and then as you lose the radar, as the storm goes offshore, these other types of information, like the imager and the lightning, sort of have this correlation that pick up. And I don't know what the decorrelation time will be, but at some point, these features are going to be decorrelated. But anyways, it starts to move 
over the ocean. It looks like a seamless image, just like a radar echo moving out. And that's important for the Gulf Stream. I know we have a lot of air routes that come down the East Coast, so there's certain utility to having something like that. And I should say the Aviation Weather Center in Kansas City is one of the biggest fans of GLM because what are you going to do on your oceanic, transoceanic routes? You're going to Europe, you're going to, uh, to Asia, and you do have some good storms. We even get supercells if you're not aware of it in the North, North Pacific. And so um, those storms, you combine the imager and the lightning mapper together, it's a poor man's radar. And so in terms of where's the intense convection that I need to be worried about, I think that's something we can't do today, and that will greatly improve. Steve, this is great. I think we, um, we will need to move on, but one more question for you that, that I asked uh, Tim. This is Dave Jones with Storm Center, and I, I was just wondering, you, you gave a great presentation on lightning. You can tell where your, your passion is and all that sort of stuff, but, but what's your feeling on the eve of launch? Uh, what what, what is, uh, impassions you about Gozar the most? Well, so um, I started in 1979. <laughs> with this instrument and you know it's gonna really happen and I've told people earlier so I'm not ashamed we had our flight readiness review two hours long and then they pulled all the launch directors are we ready yeah ready to go ready to go and I had tears in my eyes <laughs> on the phone so that's how emotional it is for me that we're finally going I'm I'm thrilled that's awesome Steve thank you very much